Welcome to the Tanz im August Podcast. This podcast series is part of the Tanz im August Festival, presented by Hau Hebel am Ufer. This year it takes place from the 9th to 26th of August in 11 locations in Berlin. Several artists from this year's program have been invited to participate in a conversation. Each episode seeks to offer insights into their creative process, uncovering what's behind the decisions they made and the knowledge they gained along the way. The artists tell listeners about their current and past projects, revealing detailed information about the work that will be presented during Tanz im August. In this episode, Ricardo Carmona, Artistic Director of the Festival, talks with Yasmin Goder. She will present two of her latest works, Practicing Empathy 1 on 24th and 25th of August and Practicing Empathy 3 on 25th and 26th of August. Hello, Yasmin. Hey. Hi. I have the pleasure to talk with you today uh, for this episode of the podcast. And I would like to ask you to present yourself and to give you a bit more information about your work and about you as an artist. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm Yasmin Goder. Um, I have a kind of history of shifts and changes uh, starting from my childhood. So I was born in Jerusalem, Israel, and then I moved to New York with my family in the 80s. And then at some point in my 20s, I came back to live in uh, Jaffa in Israel again. And since then, I've been based here. And that's where also my studio is located, my company and my work. I'm a mother. <laughs> I have a daughter and my partner, Itzik Julie, is also a longtime collaborator as a dramaturg and uh, someone that I have been working with since the beginning and kind of questioning and bringing in new and different and varying information about the work. In the last few years, maybe 10 years, I've started to acknowledge the idea that a performance has the potential to connect people, connect strangers together and give an opportunity for different people to have different experiences in the space of a performance. And I started to acknowledge that and to try to find ways of defining how that can happen, in which ways we could meet each other in these spaces and create opportunities for an exchange that maybe we don't have in other situations, in the street, in other social meetings. So that's been kind of a driving force for me in the last few years. I've always been very drawn to dealing with emotions as material, trying to think about how this aspect of our humanity is moving us. It's moving our bodies, it's moving our choices, and how it could be kind of broken up and brought back together through performance, through um different expressive and performative qualities and physical qualities as well. And somehow this question about emotions and their, I guess, drive or impulse has in the last few years evolved into this aspect of trying to find a way of connecting how this stage and place that has certain rules about how we should connect could be challenged and could be remet and could bring up the emotional aspect that exists there already in this context, but kind of bring it forth through um, an experiential aspect or experiential process. Yeah, thank you. I know it's a lot like it's, it's, yeah, there's just a lot to talk about when you've been making work for 25 years. So I try to put it in a, in a nut and it, it, it's, it's hard to somehow contain a long-term process, but it's also interesting. It's an interesting exercise. I think we're going to dive into certain things that you just said now in the next uh, minutes. Um, so this year in the festival, we will present two of your last works, Practicing Empathy Number One and Number Three. 
Mm-hmm. And they are part of a trilogy that um, goes around the topic of empathy. I wanted to ask you, why do you started to work on this topic? And what was the really initial point where you started? Take us back to this initial moment of thinking, oh, I want to do a work around empathy. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, when I started to make this more participative work or work that invites people into the stage to experience their bodies and or proposing, let's say, rituals that, uh, for example, in simple action of really connecting between performers and spectators, this word started to come up. It was a word that I knew about. So the word empathy started to come up from the audiences that came to see the work. People described their experience using this word, and it started to repeat itself somehow. And although I was aware of it, and I was, uh, in a way, I could understand why this was the word that was chosen to describe some of these experiences, I didn't really know much about it, but I was really drawn to it. So there was something like it was in the air. There was a moment where I started to feel like, okay, I, I made work, and it it had an impact on people. And now this word is coming to me and I want to acknowledge that. I want to then bring it back with me into the studio and research it and question it and uh, understand it and get confused by it. And it, I think it was in Frankfurt, we presented Simple Action and a woman in the audience afterwards wrote to me and the messenger in Facebook, she said, you know, I After seeing and experiencing the work, I went out into the street and I felt like I was practicing empathy. And so from that moment when she described her experience as such, there was something about it that really hit the spot for me. Questions about why am I doing what am I doing and and how is it touching people and how is it impacting the way people experience themselves afterwards, not just in the performance itself, but how is it then influencing or ricocheting and, and having an impact on a, on a wider level? Also internally, not just for people who are audience members, but also for us as performers. And I was really drawn to the way that she spoke about it in this idea of practicing empathy, not necessarily knowing what empathy is or saying that what was experienced was empathy, but rather the idea of practicing it or, or trying to use the tools that were given through the experience as a way of approaching going out into the world after this bubble of an experience with this new question of practicing empathy. So then it was during this time that I started to think, okay, I would like to bring this back to my work and and start to to think about it, but to think about it as a long term research because it just it felt a bit overwhelming to to think about it as just this one work or one one idea, but rather as a series of both works, but also meetings with different people, workshops, proposals, questions, so that it would give us time to also like let that land inside of our practice and inside of how we're approaching it. And it won't just stay at the, I guess, at the surface level of of what this means. So you mentioned now that uh, when you started, you had envisioned a series of works, but it was in your mind to make a trilogy or it was part of the development? I felt like I wanted to, to keep it open. I didn't know how many works there will be, but I did know that I wanted an open ended process, which For me, at least, this was the first time. Different works have influenced different works. And with each work that I make, I have new questions that I bring into my new work, or I would like to deepen certain aspects of it. But in this case, it was like understanding that this is going to be a long-term process and, and that there will be a series of outcomes. And I didn't know how many, but I knew that, you know, we'll take it one step at a time. And The first one I knew had to deal with the performers themselves and the group of people who are performing and how they engage with each other through this question of practicing empathy, developing an actual practice where we could meet in the studio to try to touch upon this idea of being empathic with one another and opening up each other's nervous system and 
personal beings to each other's daily um, emotional expression, I guess. And I knew that this was like a beginning point and then slowly we will expand it in concentric circles. Like we'll go from the inside of the company to slowly meeting people to then going out to communities that we meet when we're on tour or locally. So beginning from this deep um, center and slowly opening it up. And with COVID, obviously I, I ended up bringing it back to myself, bringing it to a solo. I, I, I didn't expect that number three will be a solo. Um, I thought that number three would be um, a work with communities that would come out of these week-long workshops in different places. And this was already planned in collaboration with different venues, but eventually it became a solo. And it's your first solo in your career. Right. Well, yes, as a, as a full evening, yes. I've, I've made solos in the past, but I've always had someone uh, enter at some point. Or I had a solo called Lie Like a Lion, where I had two musicians on stage and eventually they kind of took over the piece. And so there was always the presence of other performers. But this is really the first time I'm, I'm really alone on stage for the full work. And I think that for sure COVID and the fact that everything stopped and I was less involved in touring and teaching and performing with my company and created that space for me. And I guess it was kind of needed because um, now in retrospect, I think that's quite a long time not to make a solo for myself. <laughs> And why is that? And it brings up different questions. So yes, it was 25 years since the last time I made a solo where there was no one else on stage with me. <laughs> and how do you feel about it now? You see it as a turning point for what you're going to do next? or It definitely created the desire for more of it. You know, like I enjoy it very much and I find comfort which is surprising, but I find a lot of comfort in this experience of meeting the audience by myself and being there with people. And it created a desire to continue finding place for that. And honestly, like right now, <laughs> I'm working on two projects that have a lot of participants in them. So somehow that hunger that has evolved out of this process has not necessarily created uh, a next time, but I feel like something is slowly growing inside of me in terms of creating another solo work. In preparation of this talk, I ask you to send me some quotes and some references of books that you worked during the creation. And there's a book that you read that's called Together, The Rituals, Pleasures and Politics of Cooperation, written by Richard Sennett. There's a quote on the book that says, both sympathy and empathy cover recognition and both forge a bond. But the one is an embrace and the other is an encounter. Mm -hmm. do, do you agree with this distinction? And if yes, in what way do you see empathy as an encounter? Yeah, I was really happy to read uh, Richard Sennett because I felt like he helped me to understand a bit the perspective that was slowly being developed me around empathy, because I think empathy is, is a word that is used a lot and there's a lot of different approaches to it and people understand it in a variety of ways. And Richard Sennett is a sociologist, so there's something about his approach, almost like the tool of empathy or how it's approached or how we could learn from it being something that sometimes is almost natural in, its, in the experience that we have with others that it happens intuitively and, and it, it's almost like a natural process, but at the same time that it could be something that we are working on or developing or opening up to or keeping as a kind of method of approaching things that are less comfortable to us or less the things that we intuitively open up to. So there's something about that that really hit the spot for me about how empathy is something that requires, a, first of all, curiosity and the kind of sustaining of impulsiveness, a place of being with another person's experience, but not necessarily 
knowing about it or, or thinking that we know what it's like, or as kind of Wikipedia, I think, says, quote unquote, to be in someone else's shoes. For me, it's less about that because I question, can I even be in someone else's shoes? Do I have the ability to be in someone else's shoes? I don't think so. I think empathy is often associated with a comfortable feeling, with a feeling of softness, with a feeling of um, embrace, which I think in this specific quote is more about sympathy. And when I think about empathy, it has to do a lot more with breath, with porousness, with a place where we allow ourselves to be next to something sometimes that we don't understand or that we don't even agree with, or that we weren't structured, let's say, socially to necessarily respond to, but we can learn something about softening into it and disarming and staying curious and opening up. So this is the essential of what is interesting for me in it, because it is challenging. It's not just this wonderful thing where I can say, I'm going to be empathic and then I'm empathic. You know, how do we actually work through it? How do we actually learn to almost widen our cells, <laughs> our human cells, to, to be able to contain that because it's not always so easy. And I think in practicing empathy two by two, where we actually worked, which was format that was created during COVID to meet with audiences on a two meter by two meter square and go through a 25 minute practice without words, nonverbal, of sharing time through physicality, all these ideas became very clear on a, very, on a physical level of staying open to whoever is going to be with us and to the body of the person that is coming and meeting us and how we can, even as performers, contain the situation and lead the way almost like a parent, let's say, being the parent of the situation, but at the same time, leave a lot of space for what it is that they're expressing and responding to that. So it's like really taking these ideas and trying to work them through the body and to work them through how we're present with each other. And it touches upon also political things for me. I mean, I think that my interest in empathy, it definitely started from the work and it started from the response of audience members. But I think there's another deep aspect of it, which has to do with where I live and the fact that I live in a place where conflict is continuously present, where there isn't empathy often, where I feel like we're missing empathy and that it's something that needs to be developed. And it's like an act that needs to be widened inside, I think, of what's happening here in Israel and in relationship to the us and them into this idea of, of separation, and this idea that is constantly being in a way taught and fed. I feel like it's these layers that, you know, in my work, I always feel like that's how things happen. In a way, I made this more, I guess, participative work that wanted to create an alternative space, that wanted to define the performance space as a space that is different than the reality that's outside of the walls of the theater. And then the word empathy coming in is also maybe a reflection or a mirror of that desire. And then taking on that word and carrying it also and saying that like, this is what I'm interested in, which is quite heavy also. And at moments it's puts me to stand behind it. And then what is it that you stand behind? But I kind of like this that it does that, that it pushes the boundary with the kind of responsibility. Also internally inside, I'll just say that inside the company, I feel that using this word and practicing empathy brought up questions about how rehearsals take place, how we work as a group, how conversations are being made, how decisions are being made. Also in the administration, in the production, the answers are not always so easy. So this is why, and maybe I will connect it back to Richard Sennett, because he is talking about it as a tool in relation to working and cooperation and togetherness and, and finding social connectivity and respect. He speaks also a lot about respect. And so I found that there's something almost practical in his approach that I appreciate. You talk just now about the expansion or application of that concept also in your day-to-day -day in the studio, in the rehearsals. 
And I was curious to hear a bit more of how you use all these concepts then to make them into a choreography, mm. also like in a, yeah. in, a, in a very practical way. Yeah. Also. So I'll say with practicing empathy, number one, one of the things was that we worked on was to create kind of rituals that came out of what the performers needed or what they felt they needed support with, let's say. And so we first tried to understand, to create a kind of safe space where people could feel safe to really request or kind of dream or fantasize about what that would mean for them. And slowly through that, we developed practices that were responding to that. And eventually we narrowed it down to a few practices But what it does is that each one of the performers, for example, in Practicing Empathy Number One, expresses something vocally through a particular lift that the performers all connect to. And then all of the others try to create a song that responds to this expression. And the song could be each time different. Sometimes the song... it tries to echo or helps to echo or elongate or open up the response. And sometimes the song gives some kind of almost counterpoint response to support the, the experience, or it could be playful or humoristic or, you know, or dramatic. So this idea of echoing and staying open to responding to someone's Emotions is a way, for example, of transforming this, these ideas into choreographic modes. And then, you know, as I said, as I mentioned in Practicing Empathy 2 by 2 I worked a lot with mirroring, which is kind of like a very well-known practice in dance. But it does carry a kind of magic, this tool, because it allows for two people to be in almost a hypnotic state of being together and moving together without making decisions, without having leadership. So there was something about that that also interested me. Also, because we have this project here for people living with Parkinson's disease in a studio where I work. It's called Moving Communities, and it's a project that we have already for six years. And one of the most practiced exercises is the mirror exercise. And there's something very effective about it, even when you have two very different bodies that are expressing movement very differently or have a different background in movement. And still there's this synchronicity that can happen that's very beautiful and allows for a place of comfort. So that's another way. And I think in my solo was the first time that, you know, when I realized due to COVID that I will be working alone and I questioned this idea of self-empathy, which was a new thing for me. I actually, when I decided to research empathy, I never thought about it, this idea of self-empathy. And when I started to read about it, I realized like it's a whole thing in itself and that this whole idea of practicing towards yourself empathy, that's another layer to everything that we're doing. And so how to create that space for myself? What are the things that create comfort in my body? Where are the places that I can be less judgmental about myself? And then in relation to the audience too, and how as a performer, can I be present with people in a way that I'm still empathic towards myself while I'm also empathic towards others? It's this constant flow of accepting and agreeing to whoever's there, agreeing to to the gaze, agreeing to the presence of others while agreeing to my own process. And now I created recently a new work called SOS Songs of Sequence, which is kind of a fourth chapter, I guess, in this process. And there I really wanted to allow people to enter a space where their nervous system could have a different experience. In the last period in Israel, for since the last election, the streets are very intense. There are protests almost on a weekly basis and sometimes more than once and twice a week. And the energy in the street is quite intense and could be also aggressive, which is already a higher level of what's going on here. And I felt with SOS that our Save Our Souls is through these songs, is through these ways of being together in another way, in a softer way, in a way that allows us to 
to enter space together and give a place for the bodies of the spectators, but also of the performers to rest, <laughs> to rest and at the same time give the eligibility for very deep emotions to come out. So it's like this big range from the softness and the most subtle and most carried and caring way of being in the body and with others to the ability to scream and shout because this is like the, the spectrum. So it's been a lot of very different ways and different approaches to kind of translating all the research to body and to the nervous system and to understanding how to approach things. And ultimately, I think, especially with the performers that are with me since the beginning of this, since 2019, it's about the approach. It's about how to look. It's about how to be with others. It's about how to touch. It's less about the form. It's more about the way. And I think it's deepening with time. We're making this talk and uh, you are in your studio. And you also mentioned just a while ago that you also have workshops and classes. How these two, let's say, paths of your career connect? Mm. Like in one way, you're making shows for theater, also for museums. And in another way, there's also like the whole ongoing projects in the studio with the classes, workshops. You also do some showings mm -hmm. there, how they feed each other. Yeah, wow. I'll just say that... For example, practicing empathy, one of the workshops that I decided to do with the company was for mothers from the hand-in-hand -hand schools, which are bilingual Arabic Jewish schools in Jaffa, where I live, where my daughter goes to school. So I decided to think, okay, how do I bring this question to my locality and learn from my locality about this idea of empathy? So this was in 2020 where we invited the mothers here. And for three months, we researched with them and learned from them and talked to them about it. And since then, I opened up these workshops for long-term processes. And now it's an ongoing workshop on Friday that I have with Nur Garabli, who is a Palestinian choreographer, born and based in Jaffa. And together we carry these workshops for almost three years now. So how is it influenced? Obviously, even from having this first experience of wanting to bring in community into a research and then feeling like, okay, there's a bigger thing here. There's a need for these kind of meetings and, and discovering how dance and movement can be both healing and both a way of healing for many people, but also a way to meet and a way to connect with other stories, with other bodies, with other needs. This already started with Moving Communities in 2015, which was like a, a year-long project, which I opened the studio to and I got involved with in uh, Theater Freiburg with Monica Gillette. When the year ended, it felt like, how could we stop this incredible thing that's happening here? I mean, obviously we're a small dance company. We don't really have the resources to, to hold something like this as we did when we were part of the project. And it was one of those things that it felt like we can't just decide to stop because it's touching other people's lives and it has such an impact. And it also has had an impact back on the company on what we're doing here in the studio and how that influences our understanding of what interests us in dance and in performance and in the freedom and connection that it creates between people. And really something about accepting the body and about playfulness and question about Who are the bodies that are being expressed? How these bodies have a place to impact what we're doing, to discover things about meeting people inside the studio and letting them define and influence the way we think about what we're doing and about performance. All of these things really were things that were too strong and too um, important to let go of. So we decided to find a way to continue this project, which is happening till today. That's almost eight years that we have it in the studio. And, you know, we're, we're a small company. We don't have many resources to hold a big community project, which happens twice a week in our space. But 
it really felt like something that we couldn't let go of and we have to fight to find a way to continue, basically. And so it's still happening and it has a lot of influence on the kind of work that it's being created. Every time that we come out with a new creation, we always do open rehearsals, firstly to our moving community group. So they are our first feedback, eyes, and it's really wonderful. And also whenever we have residency programs here, they're always involved. At some point, we changed the name to Moving Community because we felt like it wasn't about Parkinson's anymore. It was about developing a community in this space, having a place to come to and just meet through dance. And um, I can't imagine now not having these projects that have become so prominent and so important in the development of the definition even of what my company does as part of it. And for sure, it, it's going and entering into what it is that I'm interested in researching and developing and each time and you. Yeah. You said many times already that uh, emotions and feelings is something that you value mm -hmm. a lot. And there's another book that you also share with me, that there's a book from Carol Julian, that the title is Why Does Patriarchy Persist? And where she says that um, our ability to communicate our own feelings and to pick up the feelings of others and thus to heal fractures in connection threatens the structures of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Feelings of empathy and tender compassion for another suffering or humanity makes it difficult to maintain or justify inequality. Mm -hmm. How do you resonate with this quote and how was important for you also this book for the creation of this series? This resonates with me in the sense that there's something that needs to crack in order for new information to come in. So I think when I say empathy and maybe there's an assumption that there is this comfort and softness, which is definitely part of it. But I think I'm drawn to the place where it asks of you to take an act or makes you have to take action in relation to it. And I think in that way, it takes down hierarchies because you have to, if you're willing to be empathic, then you can't be the one who knows or the one who understands or the one who just has the power to um, define whatever it is that you're coming in contact with. I guess this is how I'm drawn to it. And it, with empathy, it's tricky because maybe it is a privilege to practice empathy. And that's also a question. Is that a point of view of privilege? Of you have the space to even question whether you have space to practice this idea And I think, uh, yes, that it's true, but it holds me responsible. It's this mix of push and pull that I feel. There's never a right and wrong. And I like these places of confusion. And I like these places that challenge me that in the same thing that I'm drawn to, there's also a challenge that always puts me in question. <laughs> This is something I'm drawn to. And maybe that's also a place that has to do with vulnerability or the same let's say even this title, Practicing Empathy, which places me in a, a point of maybe expressing something that I desire to do with the world, to be more open and vulnerable and questioning and curious. At the same time, it turns itself back into me. It turns the pointing back to me, questioning, are you able to do that? And I guess that's how it relates. Honestly, I didn't read this whole book. I read another book of hers that I was really drawn to, where she deals with the voice of women. And this is, it takes me to the next project, which I'm now working on. But I'm this kind of breaking up of hierarchy of what are the things that we learn from very early on and that place us in position in relationship to others. How do we crack that? How can we try to question it even in the way that we approach movement in the studio or that we approach others that come to see us or that we approach how we use our voices? Even in that, there's this question of hierarchies and how we've embodied them in our personalities, in our identities. So this is what really draws me to her to understand that we're often, I can say about myself, I think that I grew up in a particular system that gave me a sense of what it is to be my identity in relationship to my environment. 
And I think that in my work and in general, also on a political level, I try to question that. I try to question these systems of definition because obviously they, they don't do, <laughs> they haven't brought us to really good places. But at the same time, I want to say, you know, maybe it goes back to your first question about, I tell me about yourself. And I think that my identity is quite mixed. I have a Jewish background from Eastern Europe, but I also have a Christian background from Eastern Europe. And I have a grandfather from Syria. This mix of identities that exist inside of me that also challenge this perception of what is being Jewish or what is being Israeli or how am I connected to my environment? Am I connected to the Middle East? Am I connected to Europe? Am I connected to, to the Arab world? Am I connected to Hebrew? Am I connected to my religion? Like these are things that I've always had bubbling up inside of me, especially then moving to the US and taking on another identity of being American. So all of this is also related back to this desire to crack because it's related to understanding for me personally in my own prism of how I experienced life, that there isn't this absolute thing or reality or understanding. So I guess, I don't know if that's very clear. It's related to this idea of, of hierarchy, because I think inside of us, often there is also hierarchies in our identity, like which part of the identity is given more platform or more of a voice, um, even in relation to gender. And do you think that uh, emotions and feelings also carry knowledge and wisdom? Definitely. And I think that one of the things that I try to do also in, in my process uh, with performers is to create a very a radical acceptance of emotions, somehow to allow for emotions to float and to be given space as they come in performing structures, in uh, knowing and not knowing where things may take us, to kind of create uh, an internal flexibility of this emotional space and allow it to be carried somehow by the work. Yeah, thank you. I think it's super important to have that space, especially when we speak about dance and performance. I think it's always valuable to have that knowledge also in our bodies and also what we carry on stage. Yeah. But thank you so much for the talk. Um, thank you. It takes a bit time to round it up, but it was a pleasure to talk with you. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to host your work in Berlin. Thank yeah. you so much. It's been a pleasure to, to share it and I'm really happy to return with these two works to Berlin. It's going to be exciting. Mm -hmm.